In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. I'd like to welcome you all to our Perseverant Family Conversation, and as always, it's great to be with all of you. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. So, as always, we like to start off our conversation by inviting Mary to be with us. Mary is truly the mother of God. Mary is the mother of the church. Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. So let's uh, start off our day, start off our week with inviting Mary to be with us. And of course, let's pray the prayer that Mary really loves most. And that prayer Mary loves most is the Hail, it's the Hail Mary. So together, let's pray the Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and bless the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Now let's turn to our spiritual director. What a great grace and privilege it is to have as our spiritual director <clears throat> the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has many wonderful names, titles, among which would be the Holy Spirit is the paraclete. That's right, the Holy Spirit is the paraclete. The Holy Spirit is also known as the gift of gifts. The Holy Spirit is also known as the sweet guest of our souls. Holy Spirit is also known as our Consoler. Our Consoler as well as our Counselor. Holy Spirit is also known as the our Interior Master or Teacher. And the Holy Spirit is also known as our Sanctifier. When we say sanctify, it means that he's the one that actually helps us to, to grow in holiness. So let's, uh, let's turn to the Holy Spirit and ask the Holy Spirit to help us to get to know God better and better every day. So let's turn to our interior master and ask him to teach us and to be with us, as we say. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us that by the same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. St. Michael the Archangel, pray for us. St. Raphael, pray for us. St. Ignatius of Loyola, Pray for us. St. Francis Xavier, pray for us. St. Maria Faustina Kowalska, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us.
In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, my friends, happy Sunday to all of you. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. And we rejoice because every Sunday, my friends, every Sunday we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So this is the day. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. The Lord is truly risen from the dead. Alleluia. 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 So let us rejoice and rejoice in the Lord. To encourage all of you, as always, I will be praying for all of you and your intentions. And I will place them on the altar in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. That's right. I'll be celebrating two Masses today on Sunday and I'd like to place all of you on the altar in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. In the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. And I'd like to offer these specific intentions for your encouragement. The first is I'd like to pray that all of us would make a concerted effort to be open to to be open to the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That we be open to the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And that we would often during the course of the day pray this short but hopefully efficacious prayer. And that prayer is, Come Holy Spirit, come. Come Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. Come Holy Spirit, come. Come Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. My next intention will be, I'd like to pray that all of you and your families would have a very special blessing today. Very special blessing today that your family members would rejoice in the Lord. Because it is more than true that true joy and true happiness can only come in a deep relationship with the Lord. That's why St. Paul in his letter to Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord, I say it again, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord, I say it again, rejoice in the Lord. So, that may be my intention. Then, my third intention will be, I'd like to pray that those who are dying today will die in the state of grace. There will be people that will be dying this very day. Let's pray for them that when they would have the grace of a holy and happy death. Because, my friends, as Jesus says, what would it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? What would it profit a man if he gains the whole Lord, world and loses his soul? Let's pray for the dying, especially those who are not well disposed, that they would open up their hearts to God's love and mercy. So, my friends, 
This is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. Every Sunday, we celebrate the Lord's Day. We celebrate his resurrection. The very heart and kernel of today is the Lord, of course, but the holy sacrifice of the Mass. By far the greatest prayer in the whole world is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. It is the prayer par excellence, the holy sacrifice of the Mass. So we want to participate in Mass fully, actively, and consciously and derive the infinite fruits that God wants to give us in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. The documents of Vatican II say that when we go to Mass, we nourish ourselves from the Mass from, from, two, alt, from two tables. We nourish ourselves from the table of the Word of God that's right. We worship ourselves from the table of the Word of God. But also we worship ourselves from another table, and that would be the body and blood of Christ. A double blessing, a double nourishment. So the Word of God, we should have, as Jesus said, responding to the devil. Man does not live on bread alone, but every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. So on Sundays, we have three readings and the responsorial psalm. Now, as you know, the first reading during the whole time of the Easter season, the Easter season which lasts from Easter Day, 50 days all the way up until the Solemnity of Pentecost, which is the coming of the Holy Spirit and the birthday of the Church. First reading, we're, we're taking that from the Acts of the Apostles. And by the way, next Sunday, I'll be starting a course on the Holy Spirit, on I'll be studying a course on the Acts of the Apostles, the whole month of May, in which at 1.30, I'll be giving a talk every Sunday during the month of May on the Acts of the Apostles, and we'll have group sharings, and then we'll be meditating this whole month, this month of May, which will be Next Sunday, on the Acts of the Apostles, known as the Gospel of the Holy Spirit. So I invite you to join me in my course on the Acts of the Apostles. I'll be giving it on Sunday in English, and on Tuesday, on, on, on Monday, I'll be giving it in English. Sp I'm sorry. Sunday will be uh, English, and then Monday will be on at 7.15 in Spanish. So... Choose your language. Choose your language. So let's uh, let's delve into the in infinite riches of the Word of God. So what we have in the first reading is the Pentecost Discourse of St. Peter. We see St. Peter with the eleven raising his voice and he's preaching basically this. He's preaching about Jesus Christ, the many prophecies that were made about him, the many prophecies that were made about Jesus there in the Old Testament, how they're realized in him. In the very heart and center or core of the preaching of St. Peter, this is called the Pentecost Discourse. 
is the rock foundation of our Catholic Christian faith. And that would be that Jesus Christ is truly risen from the dead, never to die again. That's it. That Jesus Christ is truly risen from the dead, never to die again. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. So I'd like to just pull that one idea from this reading for all of our meditation. And it's the following. The fact that Jesus rose from the dead. He spent 40 days with his apostles preaching to them teaching them, gently rebuking them, encouraging them, points to the fact that by Jesus dying, he's going to give us eternal life. By dying, he's going to give us eternal life. By dying and rising from the dead, Jesus opened up the gates, to, the gates of heaven. In all honesty, I believe that many of us, and you are very good people in this Perseverance family, but many of us do not meditate sufficiently upon the reality of heaven. Every time we say the Our Father, Our Father who art in heaven, but we do not meditate sufficiently on heaven. We have to. We cannot imagine how great heaven is. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it entered into the mind of man the wonderful things that God has prepared for those who, who love him. And Jesus says, I'm going now to prepare a place for you, so that where I am, you also may be. In my Father's house there are many mansions, if it were not so, I would not tell you. So those words should be of great encouragement to all of us. That Jesus, rising from the dead, 40 days afterward, ascending on high, sitting at the right hand of, the, of God, from, there, from thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. That Jesus, by doing that, he's opened up the gates of heaven for all of us. And Teresa of Avila says that if we would really meditate upon heaven, we could carry the heaviest crosses. This great woman doctor of the church, St. Teresa of Avila, states that our life on earth is like one night in a lousy motel. That's what she says. Una noche en una mala taverna, in her Spanish. Our life is like one night in a lousy, cheap hotel. Then it's over. Then we'll be introduced into the eternal gates of heaven to be with the Lord, his mother, the angels and saints forever and ever and ever. Amen. So my friends, that's my one comment I'd like to make on the first reading, that Peter speaks very eloquently with great conviction and with great unction that Jesus Christ, that they put to death, he's risen from the dead, never to die again. So St. Paul also says, lift up your eyes to heaven, to the higher realm. Not to focus upon the things of the earth, but lift, lift up your eyes to heaven and focus upon the Lord who is waiting for you and for me. But let's pray for each other. For, in the words of St. Alphonsus Maria Liguori, doctor of the church, that all of us would attain what is called the grace of all graces. The grace of all graces is the grace to die, to persevere and die in the state of grace. This, this, uh, family that we belong to. It's called the Perseverance family. 
That's right. We're called the Perseverance Family. We're praying that we would persevere in our Holy Hour, in our Rosary, in our Confessions, in our Mass, in our love for Mary, avoiding sin, and if we fall, to get up as soon as possible, trusting in Jesus all the more. That's one of the primary purposes of our Perseverance families to to help us all to make it to heaven. That's right. To help us all to make it, to persevere in our pursuit of attaining the imperishable crown, as St. Paul calls it. The crown that never perishes. So there we have it. The response real psalm, my friends, is taken from Psalm 16. And the antiphon is, Lord, you will show us the path of life. Lord, you will show us the path of life. My friends, Jesus also says that the path is narrow. Okay. Few, few there are that find that path. Let's decide to choose the narrow path. The narrow path, my friend, is the way of the cross. The way of prayer. The the, the way of asceticism, the way of mortification, the way of love, the way of mercy, the way of forgiveness. That's the path of life that God wants to indicate to us. The second reading, my friends, is taken from the first letter of St. Peter. I like to call this the first encyclical, because it's the first letter written by the first Pope, St. Peter. I'd like to just give you a, a summary and a point to this, then we'll move into the, to the Gospel for today. St. Peter says that we were saved with the precious blood of Christ. We are saved by the precious blood of Christ. In those words, my friends, Peter is pointing out our, our great dignity and our great destiny. That's right, our great dignity, dignity and our great destiny. That we were not saved or ransomed by the blood of goats or heifers or animals as it was in the Old Testament. Nor were we bought back by gold or silver. But we were redeemed, as Peter points out, by the precious lamb, by the, pre by the blood of Jesus Christ, of that spotless, unblemished lamb. So, my friends, your soul has great value. Your soul has great value, infinite value. I said it once and I'll say it again. You are so precious in the eyes of God. You are so precious in the eyes of God that if you are the only person in the whole universe, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ would have been incarnate, he would have suffered, died. He would have shed every drop of his precious blood for your salvation and for mine. He would have shed every drop of his precious blood for your salvation and for mine. As Pope St. Leo the Great says in his Christmas homily, Christians, recognize your great dignity. Christians, recognize your great dignity. So that's the point I'd like to lay in your hearts in the, uh, the reading from the letter of St. Peter. And the last thing that he says is, conduct yourselves with reverence during the time of your sojourning. 
So let's be reverential in the church to God. And let's have great respect and reverence for our brothers and sisters because we are created in the image and likeness of God. And if we're baptized, we are truly sons and daughters of God. So let us conduct ourselves with great reverence in our short sojourn in this life. So my friend, let's move into the gospel for today. I'd like to present to you a what might be considered an Ignatian Easter contemplation. Because today, my friends, taken from the Gospel of St. Luke, we have one of the most beautiful, charming, heartwarming, inspiring gospel passages in the Bible. And this is only found in the gospel of this is only found in the gospel, my friends, of Saint Luke. Actually, the last chapter of the Gospel of Saint Luke. This, my friends, you know it pretty well, but let's go through it. This is the the disciples on the road to Emmaus. So let's uh, get on, get on your hiking boots, if you like. Do you have hiking boots? Make sure you tie your shoestrings, okay? Make sure you tie your shoestrings because get on your hiking boots because we're going to take a walk. We're going to be walking about seven miles. Have you ever walked seven miles? Well, when I've gone on vacation, I, I walk a good seven miles, sometimes even more. So let's, uh, St. Ignatius calls it the composition of place. Let's set the scene. Let's set the scene of this wonderful, wonderful, inspiring, encouraging biblical passage. So where, when, who, and how? Let's start with when. When does this take place? When does this take place? Well, it takes place actually Easter Sunday night. One of the writers says that Jesus was very anxious to get up as early as possible Easter Sunday morning to share his joy with his friends. So Jesus appears to his blessed mother and he appears to Mary Magdalene. And then, in the afternoon, Jesus is going to appear another time. This is Easter Sunday afternoon. Let's try to imagine this, uh, this wonderful scene. It's, it's inspiring. Bishop Robert, ja uh, Bishop Robert Barron says that they were walking the wrong way. Kind of like that. That analysis they're they're walking the wrong way <laughs> have you ever walked have you ever walked the wrong way we probably I have you probably have also sometimes walking the wrong way you know my friends before the um, the electronic map I'm a pretty good driver but I get lost easily but now with my electronic map, I don't get lost too easily because I just follow the voice of the lady that's directing me. I obey her voice. You know? As long as I obey her voice, I arrive at my destination. Even if I make, even I make a, a wrong turn, she'll say, hey, make a U-turn. But she won't bark at me or get angry at me. She, she'll say, the next street, take a U-turn. So if we have been if we've been walking on the wrong path in our lives, we can make a U-turn. What do you think about that? You like that idea? We can all 
make a U-turn if we've been walking on the wrong path, like the prodigal son and like these two disciples. So it's Easter Sunday afternoon. These two disciples are walking the wrong way. Where are they walking? Well, they're walking. They're walking from Jer Jerusalem. They're heading toward the little town of Emmaus. Emmaus, which is about seven miles away from Jerusalem. So they're walking, they're walking, they're walking the wrong way. So we got two of them. One, his name is Cleophas, and the other one, we really don't have his name. But in the Ignatian contemplation, we can say that that other, that other person walking is you and me. Commentators say it was probably St. Luke. However, in our Ignatian contemplation, we can make that person to be ourselves, that we are walking. And we have walked in the wrong direction, and we can make that U-turn, as they will be making U-turn. That's true. And Laurie says, going downhill. Yeah, sometimes we're, we're going uphill and we're going uphill in the wrong direction. When we're going downhill, we got wind in our sails and it's easier. That's true. And so they're, they're taking a walk and they are in a state. They're in a state of desolation. All of you, all of you, you know what desolation is by now. You know what it is because we talk about the Ignatian rules very often. And there's, the state of desolation is basically they feel they feel depressed. So we all go through that at times. We all we all go through the dark tunnels. So they're taking this walk. They're in desolation. And the topic of their conversation is what happened to Jesus. But instead of having kind of a friendly conversation which they're sharing ideas, friendly conversation where they're sharing ideas, they're actually kind of they're kind of quarreling among themselves. Well they're, they're disagreeing, they're going back and forth, they're quarreling. How often have we ended by, by quarreling with people? G.K. Chesterton says that we can. We can have a, a debate among ourselves, but we're kind of, we're angrily quarreling with each other. That's. That's an exercise in futility. It's useless. An exercise in futility. It's actually useless. It really is. An exchange of ideas when we're open to the other person's viewpoint, there's some advantage of that. But we're just going to be attacking each other. That's counterproductive, to say the least. So they're walking. They're talking. And all of a sudden, what happens? All of a sudden, this man, this stranger comes out of nowhere. And this stranger coming out of nowhere is walking side by side with them. That's right, he's walking side by side with them. And this stranger, we know it's Jesus Christ. But they do not recognize him. It's fascinating when you meditate upon the Easter contemplations, how often, how often Jesus appears, but they simply do not recognize him. Off the top of my head, 
there are three that occur to me. First is Mary Magdalene. Jesus appears to her. And mistakenly, Mary Magdalene, mistakenly, Mary Magdalene believes that Jesus Christ is, is the gardener. That's right. She, she believes that Jesus Christ is the gardener. Then, at the very end of the Gospel of St. John, chapter 21, the, Peter and the apostles are fishing the whole night. They're early in the morning. There's a man on the shore, and, they, and the man says, hey, My children, have you caught any fish? And they say, No. He says, Cast the net on the other side of the boat. They obey, and they catch 153 big fish. Then eagle-eyed John says, It's the Lord! It's the Lord! It's the Lord! Peter jumps in the lake and he swims to the shore about a hundred yards. So Mary Magdalene does not recognize Jesus. The apostles do not recognize Jesus. And these two disciples, they do not recognize Jesus. Now, How often has it happened? How often has it happened that we that we in our lives do not recognize our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? How often have we bl been blinded from seeing Jesus Christ? Morally speaking, these are the principal morally speaking, these are the principal causes of spiritual blindness. Number one, ignorance. Number two, related ignorance, a lack of good catechesis. Number three would be sin. Sin blinds us. Judas went out and he was in the darkness. Number four, our passions. Number five would be that of anger and envy, which blinds us. Number six would be lustfulness. St. Thomas Aquinas says lustfulness blinds us. Number seven would be pride. Pride is truly a, a source of blindness. Number eight is contact with false religions can actually blind us to the true religion, which is our Catholic religion. Number nine would be the devil. The devil is the father of lies. And St. Paul actually says that the devil who's the father of lies is a liar from the beginning, and he can he can disguise himself as a, an angel of light. And number 10 would be associating with, with bad company. So I've given you 10 of the different causes of blindness. Do you like that? You might even write those down. I give you 10 different reasons why we can become blind. We can become morally, spiritually blind. I think you, you'll really like that very much and, and, read it, and meditate upon it. So they're walking the wrong way. And this stranger comes out of nowhere. He's walking with them. And as we said, they don't recognize him. So as they walk, the stranger catches up with them and he's walking with them. My friends, Jesus wants to Jesus want, wants to walk with us. When we are going the wrong way, 
Jesus pursues us. You people who like literature, which I do, perhaps one of the greatest writings on this topic is by Francis Thompson. And it's a literary masterpiece called The Hound of Heaven. The very simple interpretation of the hound of heaven is that God goes after us like a hound and he's pursuing us. He's going after us when we're walking, we're walking down the wrong path. So Jesus pursues them and he's walking with them. He's walking with them and he's walking at their pace. He's not walking behind them, and he's not walking ahead of them, but he's walking at their pace. Really what you have in this is that Jesus, how good Jesus is, is that he, Jesus is so good that he adapts to us. We're just converting to the faith. He's not going to be asking us to do three holy hours, pray ten rosaries, and go to three masses a day. That's not the way he is. He adapts to us, and then he's always going to be challenging us to do a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. So in a perseverance family, not not to be not not to be uh, afraid, but Jesus is always going to ask a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. So we can say eventually, it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. So he wants to he wants us to pick up our pace. He'll walk at our pace, but he want uh, he wants us to pick it up. Because Jesus wants us to become saints. So they're walking and talking. Jesus is walking side by side with this stranger that they're really going to fall in love with. This stranger. And he says, uh, "What are you talking about?" They look at him and they say, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about Jesus of Nazareth? He says, What things? Now, what Jesus is trying to do, he says, What things? Jesus is really challenging them. And he's going to do this for us. He's really challenging them to go. Challenging them to go deep into their hearts. Deep into their hearts and to dig deep. To go deep into their heart, to, to go to dig deep. And to bring to the Lord to bring to the Lord to bring to ding to the Lord all of what's bothering them to bring to the Lord their desolation that's right to bring to the Lord their desolation that's a good thing for all of us Absolutely. Absolutely. To tell the Lord in with utmost sincerity, what is it what is it that's bothering us? And all my friends, I encourage all of you to make a holy hour. One of your best holy hours. One of your best holy hours could be when you dig deep into your hearts and you bring to the Lord maybe three of the things that are bothering you most. 
probably probably it's it probably one would be there's someone in your family that is rock walking in the wrong direction that's right There's someone in your family that's walking in the wrong direction. And you hope that he will make a U-turn. Perhaps it's some physical condition, uh, condition that you're struggling with. Some ache, some pain, some uncertainty. St. Peter says, cast your cares upon the Lord because he cares for you. Do not be afraid to open up and to unload with the Lord. Peter says, cast your cares on the Lord because he cares for you. Jesus says this, Come to me, all of you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am meek and humble of heart. For you will find rest for your souls. Because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come to me, all of you. My friends, do not be afraid to go before the Lord. This is a strong expression, to spill your guts. That's pretty strong New York language. But what we're really saying, none of us should be afraid to go to the Lord and just cast your cares upon the Lord because he cares for you. And he'll never abandon you. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom should I fear? Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Behold, I will be with you always until the end of time. Do not be afraid, it is I. These are all many beautiful biblical verses in which we're challenged to entrust ourselves to the Lord. And over the past couple of years, a very powerful novena is the novena of surrender that many of you are, are undertaking. That beautiful nine-day novena which was for surrendering ourselves to God's divine providence. Surrendering ourselves to divine providence. Thanks be to God. So then we have them walking and talking. And Jesus... Jesus allows them to open up their hearts and speak very openly, sincerely, spontaneously about what's bothering them. And that we have to do the same thing. That's right. We have to do the same thing as these disciples on the road to Emmaus. So, they're talking about what happened to Jesus. About his crucifixion, his death. And some women have even said that he's risen from the dead. But they, they believe it's just wives' tales. It's just a concoction. It's an invention. It's a fantasy. It's a hysteria. These women sometimes they have these hysteria. It's a figment of their imagination. It really didn't happen. They're doubting. Have you ever doubted? I wonder if there's this doubting Thomas within us at times. I wonder if even in our family perseverance, one of our key challenges is that of trust. 
Maybe we really don't trust our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as much as we should. In the divine mercy image, Jesus, I trust in you. Maybe we say it with our lips, but not really with our hearts. And God is willing to give us. God is willing to give us in proportion or commensurate with the trust that we have in him or the lack of trust that we don't have in him. So they're opening up, they're just unloading, and this foreigner, this pilgrim, this stranger, he's listening to them very attentively. That's right. He's listening to them very, very attentively. Listen to them very attentively. Never forget. In any time, any place, any circumstance, any time, any event, any circumstance, we can open up and talk to the Lord. Any time, any event, any circumstance, we can open up and we can talk to the Lord. Always. The Lord is never too busy. He always has time for us. But sometimes, ironically, we don't have time for Him. He's all he's never bored with us. Oh, here he is again, the same thing, the same problems. In human relationship that happens. Oh, here he is. He's always griping, always complaining. The Lord loves to hear us griping, complaining. And isn't it it's interesting when we start to gripe, complain with the Lord. Even though our problems are not always resolved, after we've done that, we feel much better. How true that is. Try it. Come to me, all of you are weary, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, because I am meek and humble of heart. For you will find rest for your souls. Because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Cast your cares upon the Lord. Because he cares for you. Cast your cares upon the Lord because He cares for you. My friends, in this biblical passage, there are so many themes. We haven't even arrived at the home in Emmaus, but I'd like to just leave with you one more idea because there's tons of themes. And I thought I would just talk with you, walk with you, walk with Jesus, and encourage all of us to open up our hearts. Open up our hearts and just cast our cares upon the Lord because He cares with you. Related to that is one other short, simple, but important idea. These disciples on the road to Emmaus they started off walking, plunged into a very, I'd say, a very, a very deep desolation. That's right. We've been in desolation. 
We all have. We know what it is. Yet Father Tim Gallagher says we shouldn't be ashamed that we go through desolation because that's part of the human condition. But we have to know what to do and what not to do. That's the key. We have to know what to do and what not to do. That's the key. What to do and what not to do. Now, what's going to happen to them is they start off in desolation. But their desolation is going to disappear. So they're going to move from des desolation to consol consolation. How does it How does it, how does it materialize? When we're walking in the wrong direction, my friends, by walking in the wrong direction, it means we're not walking with Christ. When we're walking in the wrong direction, we're not walking with Christ. Then that is a sure remedy it's a sure remedy to be cast into a state of desolation. But once we walk with the Lord, we talk to Him, we open up, we cast our cares upon the Lord. then that's a sure remedy, my friends, to pass from desolation to consolation. And Mary Jo says, I love the end where we recognize Jesus in the breaking of the, of the bread, how true, which is the Eucharist. Very good, very good end comment. So my friends, share our conversation with your friends. And this is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. And I'd like to give you my priestly blessing. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless all of you on this day in which we celebrate our Lord's resurrection.